So welcome to our third topic, which is from chapter four. And you might notice that today I only have 29 slides. But I'm going to go through those 29 slides in quite a significant amount of detail because today we're going to learn about what the auditor is responsible for and we're also going to learn about the objectives of the audit and how we determine whether accounts are actually true and fair. So we're going to come across a word that you've probably not really used or heard of before, which is this word here, assertions. All right. And this is going to be a key foundational piece of knowledge moving forward into the rest of the course. So important, I'm going to talk about it this week, I'm going to talk about it next week, I'm going to talk about it the week after, the week after, then we have a break, so you won't hear about it that week, and then the week after that. So it's one of these really important foundation things. Now what you see here in the objectives for this week is that you notice that I might, I've crossed out a few uh, learning objectives and chapters out of, sections out of the textbook. And that's because these tend to create more confusion than clarity for students. Um, so we're going to sort of approach the idea of, well, what am I looking for in the audit from a slightly different perspective than the way it's captured in the text? Um, so you can forget about reading those little sections uh, in the text. So what are we going to do today? And I'll cover a few of the things. Let me just change my highlighter to a smaller size. So we're going to look at the objective of an audit. Why on earth do I do an audit? Um, for various reasons. What are management's responsibilities? I have responsibilities to check whether the financial statements are true and fair and I have to give an opinion, but what is management's job? Um, I'm going to look at my responsibility for looking for errors in the accounts. How much do I have to look for? Um, and we're going to look at financial statement cycles, which is the way that we approach doing auditing and how we break down all of the accounts. Um, we're going to look at how we get um, assurance by looking at different transactions, uh, account balances, and the presentation of the reports. We're going to look at this word called assertions, which is sort of a new term. Um, and then we're going to look at how we use our assertions to, calc to generate and gather audit evidence that will help us generate our opinion. All right, that ASA 700 says that we have to generate 705 as well and 706, but then also the Corporations Act says you must provide this report. So it might not seem like much, but there's some really key important concepts. So why do we have an audit? And I'm going back to the auditing standards here, ASA 200. Okay. Now, if you want to look at your auditing standards and you don't have the auditing standards handbook, if, you know, I wouldn't recommend buying one if you didn't already have one or get one off a friend or borrow one from someone from work. But you'd go to this website here. Am I missing out on something really exciting at the front? They're like laughing uncontrollably. No? Ah, okay. If it was really cool, I'd want you to share it with us. So auasb.gov.au and you'll find all of the auditing standards free to download. Right, don't have to pay for them. Um, you can print out the ones that you want. You can you know, keep them on your tablet. So ASA 200 is about why we actually want to go and do the audit. So let's look at some key deciding factors. All right. So the purpose of our audit is to enhance the degree of confidence of the intended users in the financial report. We do that by expressing opinion on whether the report is prepared in all material respects in accordance with an applicable financial reporting framework. All right? So that's the, the purpose of why I'm doing my audit. So if I think about confidence, all right, we give the financial report confidence by providing credibility. All right. so, and our cr credibility and our independence and our expertise increases the reliability of that information. Now, who are our intended users? Shareholders, okay. 
So generally it's our shareholders who are going to be our intended users of our financial information. And what would we call our applicable financial reporting framework, do we think? How do we know whether people are doing the accounting correctly? What do we compare everything to? The standards, yes. So our financial reporting framework is our AASBs. All right, so that's the objective of doing the report. Now, what is the benefit for companies for actually doing that? Um, and you have to go back quite a long way. I think it's to like the 1900s to look at companies at a time where there were people who voluntarily chose to have audits. And so from, you know, the pre-1900s, the evidence shows that voluntary, oops, I can't spell, voluntary, voluntary audits gave firms a number of different advantages. Usually a lower cost of capital or lower interest rates. Access to greater funds or more investors. All right. So when you look back to companies that choose to have an audit, they get lower interest rates from the bank or they have to pay lower fees on any debts that they might have and they get access to a much greater range of funds because people are more willing to rely on information that's been audited, all right? information that has been independently checked. This is a bit um, sort of like, uh, at the moment, you know, Donald Trump is refusing to release his tax returns. And you can look at every one of Hillary and Bill Clinton's tax returns back to 1970-something. Um, and that adds credibility to their campaign because those tax returns have been independently checked by the Internal Revenue Service, whereas Donald is saying, look, I'm not, just not going to tell you. And then we sort of go, well, what's going on there in terms of what's going on? I heard a conspiracy theory the other day that apparently now that you know, he's actually the candidate, he's making bad choices so that people don't vote for him on purpose because he doesn't actually want to be the president. I don't know. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I heard that and I thought that was quite interesting. So how do I develop my, and I'm going to cross out objectives here, and I'm going to develop my audit plan. All right. We have to have a plan for doing an audit. We just don't go in and say, hey, let's audit stuff. Like, you know, th this is like going to the Boxing Day sales. All right. You want to have a plan of what you want to look for. I want socks, or I want a big screen TV, or I want you know, cheap shoes, or a fantastic expensive bag for cheap. You have to have a plan. So like anything, we need to have steps to develop that. So we need to learn, well, what are we doing on the audit? What are our objectives? What sort of transactions occur within the business? Look at management and their assertions about their accounts. What are they saying about the financial statements? And then we're going to learn about specific audit assertions for the financial statements, all right? Because somehow I need to figure out what number is true and how do I figure out what is the truth? Um, are there characteristics of the truth? You know, when we're trying to find out you know, who killed somebody, we look for certain evidence about you know, who had the murder weapon, who had the motive, who had the opportunity, and then we make a decision about who did it and who didn't do it. When it comes to financial statements, we also look at things like who has the motivation to manipulate the accounts, who has the opportunity to manipulate the accounts and what does the evidence tell us. So what are management's responsibilities for preparing the financial statements? Because I know my job as the auditor is to go through and to search for information and make sure it all looks correct. So we have a number of different responsibilities as, man as the management. So management have to make choices on accounting policy. They have to decide whether FIFO or weighted average is the best method for, auditing inven uh, for valuing inventory. Are we using straight line or reducing balance? What's the way that our asset gets used so that this is really important? So they have to pick the right accounting policies and their accounting policies have to 
reflect the underlying operations of the business. So you can't choose an accounting policy just because it gives you the biggest profit. You have to pick the one that is most appropriate. The second thing that the auditor has to, or sorry, that management are responsible for, are designing the internal controls of the organisation. So what exactly are the internal controls? The internal controls are a range of things. They're the policies, procedures, and rules of the organisation. All right. Now, those policies and procedures and rules could be about hiring people. It could be about how to make the product, how to handle something, um, how to deal with a refund. So why do you think companies want good policies, procedures and rules? Why is that important? Any ideas? What if there were no rules on enrolments for students? How many students would probably make a mistake in their enrolment? Right? I can remember, you guys have it so easy in the days of online. I remember lining up and you'd write your enrolment on paper and you'd line up in this queue and you'd have to go to this computer lab where there were like five computers. We didn't have all the computers we have now. And you'd give that thing, piece of paper to somebody and they'd try and type it in and go, oh, sorry, that class is full. Choose another one. Oh. You have to get out of the queue, go back, look at the other classes that could be available, get back in the queue, wait, go up, somebody types in, oh, I'm sorry, that one's now full. What other choice do you have? <laughs> so certainly, we want policies, procedures and rules to ensure that we have consistency. All right? And consistency is really important because all of these policies and procedures, etc., help the company collect data about transactions. And then, at some point, you want to use all of that data to make decisions. Okay, so down here, you're going to have data, and that data is going to go into decisions. And if that data is not consistent, and it's not all recorded in the same way, and it's not all treated in the same way, then the decisions you make might not be based on the right thing. They might not be based on everything measured the same way, which could result in disastrous decision making. So how many people here want to be auditors? One. Will, you don't want to be an auditor? He doesn't know yet. That's all right. That's all right. I'll convince you all by the time we get to week 11. You'll all be saying, yes, auditors, my religion. OK. So hands up who wants a career in something else, but in business still. Most people. Who wants to do something completely different to business? Wants to be a gardener, join the army, you know, Instagram star, I don't know, there could be all sorts of different options. No matter what you do in any of those business careers, whether it's marketing or human resources or finance, all right, you're going to need to make sure that there are good policies and procedures in place. Otherwise, how do you know which salespeople deserve the biggest bonus? Or how do you decide which marketing plan to choose? How do you know if your marketing program has been effective unless you're collecting data in a way that's consistent so that you can make good decisions? And that's one of the key things about this subject. It's not just about auditing. We're going to teach you how to analyse business situations, see what risks the company faces, and see what sort of controls and policies and procedures they should have to enable themselves to make the best and most effective business decisions. And I had a student who'd done four years in a cadetship. This is about 12 years ago. He came to me at graduation and he said, Amanda, I've joined the army. And I went, what? He goes, I'm driving tanks now and shooting, blowing up stuff. And I said, Okay, so do you use anything that you learn at university in that situation? And he said, absolutely. It's in a different scenario, though. So he's driving a tank along a road in hostile territory, and he has to evaluate his options. He has to look out there and say, where are the risks? Where could there be an IED? Where is there an unlikely, a likely spot for an ambush? 
And what controls can I put in place to minimize that? Oh, we could use a smaller vehicle here. We could take this route. I could make sure I put these procedures in place to keep my people safe. So no matter what you want to do, whether it is blow up stuff in a tank or it is a business career, the idea of being able to develop procedures to make sure that the decision-making information is appropriate is really, really cr critical. Okay? Unless you happen to like win lotto and you're just going to sit on the beach drinking Mai Tais every day, um, then that's not going to be a problem. So, so far, management are responsible for choosing the right accounting policies and having the right internal controls. And what the last thing that they're responsible for is making sure that there are fair representations in the financial statements. That means that what they are doing is they are telling the truth. All right. And it's part of our job to determine whether they are really telling the truth or not. Um, and this always reminds me of that movie with uh, Tom Cruise in A Few Good Men, where you know, he's like, what's the truth? And Jack Nicholson says, you can't handle the truth. Well, realistically, that's what we want. So that people who are invested, our shareholders, can use the financial statements to make the best decision for their independent situation. It's so important that management do tell the truth that they actually sign a declaration. So this goes in the annual report. So you'll actually find this in the annual report. And what the directors will do is they will sign that, and if you have a read here, the financial statements give a true and fair view of the financial position and comply with the accounting standards and that the company will be able to pay its debts when they become due. So they sign a legal document that says we are telling the truth. Now, the reason that they sign that is because, number one, when you sign something, psychology tells us that you pay more attention and you give it some real thought. Number two, if you breach this, you've at, and it's, you know, ASIC, for example, investigates and finds out that you've lied about a whole lot of information, they will say, oh, but you signed this bit of paper that said you were telling the truth. And they've clearly got you in violation of the Corporations Act. All right. And that is the point at which penalties can be applied to the point where you could go to jail as a manager if you do the wrong thing. So what is the auditor's responsibility then if managers... Our responsibility, uh, our responsible, our responsibility, I'm losing the plot here, are responsible for telling the truth. Oh, I forgot to put a reference in here, that's my bad. This all comes from ASA 200, again. And it says the objectives of the auditor. Well, what are my objectives? My objectives are to obtain reasonable assurance. Now, the key here is that my reasonable assurance is not a guarantee. Why is it not a guarantee? It's not a guarantee because I do not test every single transaction. Right. And it, would, it would be impossible. I couldn't test all of Woolworth's transactions in years. It would take me too long. So I'm giving reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free from material misstatement due to fraud or error in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework. Now, we already know about the applicable financial reporting framework. That's the AASBs. We've talked about that. But what does it mean when we have material misstatements? And I'm going to go through that in two separate parts. So the first bit I'm going to look at is this idea of materiality. And materiality is really a measure of significance or importance. All right. What sort of errors would be so important that we would want shareholders to know about? Right. How big an error? On what sort of topic? And that means that because we're thinking, well, to the users and relative to the size of the company, what could be important, 
this level of materiality is also relative. So think about Bill Gates. Right? If Bill Gates lost $200 out of his wallet, he's like, eh, got billions more. $200 is chump change, not a big thing. Now, if you lost $200 out of your wallet, you'd be like, oh my God, $200, that was my rent money for this week, or that was my money to buy textbooks or pay for these certain things. So, for small companies, the amount that's material is smaller compared to big companies. I've been to companies where I've you know, found something that's $10 million in size and they've gone, not material. Like, okay, well, to a multi-billion dollar company, $10 million isn't an issue. Sometimes they have rounding errors of 10 or 15 or 20 million that gets rounded up um, into smaller amounts. So it's about significance. And then my misstatements could actually be due to two reasons. They could be due to fraud, and fraud is usually characterised by some sort of intention to deceive. All right, so that's the, uh, the fraud section. Or error, all right? And the error is simply, I make a mistake. And we'll look at the sort of different types of errors. Uh, let me, oh, no, don't do that. I'm gonna move this down here, put that over there. So we're looking for both. I'm looking for intentional deception. I'm just keeping my eye out though for it. Remember the Kingston Cotton Mill case? I'm the watchdog, not the bloodhound. And then I'm also looking for mistakes. Now, less than 5% of auditors in practice have ever found fraud. So it's pretty hard to find, but most people can find mistakes. So that's, don't be surprised if in your first year you don't find a fraud. You might be keeping your eyes out for a fraud, but um, it can be quite difficult. Um, we really, there's a saying that you really only catch the stupid people engaged in fraud because it's easy to find, but the complex stuff that brings down significant, you know, big companies um, and that sort of thing. And last week I, oh, did anybody go and watch Money Monster after me telling you to watch it last week? No? Oh, okay. Homework still again this week. Go and watch Money Monster. But for a fraud that was as complicated as we saw in the Money Monster movie with George Clooney and with Julia Roberts, that would not be something that the auditor would be expected to detect because it's really complicated. So when I'm looking at evidence and part of my job and my responsibility is to be something called professionally sceptical. Now, we've probably heard the word sceptic before, right? Your sceptics, there are different sorts of sceptics, right? This, there are your crazy sceptics, like every time you get your blood taken, what's actually happening is a GPS tracker is being put in there and, you know, they're monitoring everything that's happening to us. Um, at which point, you know, not that sort of scepticism. Professional scepticism is about having a critical eye and having a critical assessment of audit evidence to make sure we question the reliability of the information obtained from management. Right? So I look at information and I say, with my questioning mind, does this seem right? Does this seem reasonable? Okay, if I told you if Apple management, so we know Apple, maker of all sorts of devices, Apple said, we are not spending any money on research and development this year. Do you think that would be something you would expect from one of the world's leading technology companies? Probably not. Because right? all their product, their model is based on introducing new and newer and newer versions of products. I once had some students who both missed the final exam and um, they applied that they were sick. One student lived in St. Leonard's, the other student lived in Hurstville, and uh, they both had the same thing. All right, now I can't remember what it was that, that uh, they said that they were ill with. And when I looked at the applications, I thought, you know, the first one, I thought, oh, student's sick, okay. Flipped over the next page, oh, this student is sick with the same thing. And I knew that they were in the same tutorial class because I was teaching the tute. And then I looked at the doctor and I thought, because I noticed the handwriting was similar. Oh, this is a bit strange, okay. Why did two students, one who lived in Campbell, uh, sorry, in St. Leonard's, the other one who lived in Hurstful, go to Campbelltown to see a doctor to get a medical certificate? 
on the day of the exam where the doctor is ticked that they were so severely affected uh, in the category of severely affected is like you can't even get out of bed. How did that happen? Why is this possible? You know, what was going on here? Um, so I questioned the students and oh, they were like, oh, we were studying at a friend's place in Campbelltown and that's why we went to go see the doctor in Campbelltown. I'm like, well, if you were coming to the exam the next day, it's a bit weird that you stay overnight at a friend's place much further away from where you live and where the university is. I said, you know, so why did you get sick? Oh, I individually asked them. One said bad pizza, the other one said bad Chinese takeaway. And I went, hang on a second, did you eat pizza and Chinese takeaway? <laughs> Whose story is the right story? And we, you know, eventually dug into everything that happened. Um, the person whose place they were staying at, I contacted that person, was that person, you know, I said, oh, yeah, I'm just checking, was this student here? Oh, no. Ah, oh, okay. In the end, it turns out that those students knew that this doctor would write them a medical certificate for whatever they wanted. So that's why they travelled so far. So if you're ever sick and you say, you know, you <laughs> need a medical certificate and you present one to me and I, I, I check where you live and you've gone 50 kilometres out of your way to see a doctor, my first, I'm going to be suspicious straight away. All right. In a second example, a student once applied uh, for special consideration because they'd been ill and when I looked at the piece of paper, the doctor had put a stamp on there and then filled in their Medicare details, their um, Medicare provider number. And, you know, everything looked fine, and I turned over the page, and what happens when you stamp with an ink stamp on a piece of paper? The ink bleeds through onto the other side. And when I turned the paper over to look at the next one, I noticed, hang on a second, there's no ink blot, you know, ink blot bleeding through on the other side. Turns out the student had taken an old special consideration that a doctor had signed before, scanned it, and then used Photoshop to create this new form that made it look like the doctor's signature and everything was there, but the stamp didn't bleed through the other side, okay? So the problem with me being a former auditor is that I've always got this questioning mind, right? Whenever you come up to me with something, I'm always saying, does that seem reasonable? Does this evidence look suspicious? Um, which I'm pretty sure when my son gets much older, is going to be bad for him and it's going to cause me no end of stress. Where were you? That's not what your GPS on your phone said you were doing. That's not what, fa I've had students, oh, I'm really sick today. And then I happen to like, you know, click on their Instagram and there they are at the beach. So just be careful. You might, try, you might be able to fool other people. I, I, I tried to be uh, pretty thorough. So what are my responsibilities for detecting errors? All right. So I plan my audit to detect unintentional mistakes. And 99% of the time, that's what I find. I find mistakes in calculations. I find things forgotten. I often find transposition errors, which is when you get two numbers mixed up around the wrong way. You have misapplication of accounting standards. Oh, I didn't know we changed to weighted average from something else. You get people that forget to include items in cost pools when they're doing cost accounting or they use the wrong cost driver. They, sometimes when you have people, I once came across somebody who had done some home handy person repairs. So they'd bought themselves a circular saw at Bunnings and were doing some handy stuff on the weekend, had managed to slice their finger open. So they had stitches and they had this big bandage on their finger which meant that when they were trying to do the accounting and typing stuff in, they typed in some wrong numbers. So mistakes can happen in all sorts of different ways. I, one of my clients actually had two people sharing a job. One person did like, I think Monday to Wednesday, the other person did Thursday, Friday. Something happened in the handover and they paid a whole range of clients twice, or cust sorry, a whole range of suppliers twice. And it wasn't small, it was like $5 million and $7 million that had been paid twice. And the suppliers were like, uh, we're not giving it back. We'll hold on to it and we'll take your, you know, the money you owe us later off that. So we'll keep a bit of a running tab. So mistakes can happen. They happen all the time. And it's, it's because we're human, right? 
I've been tired and I've typed in something wrong this morning. Uh, so this morning when I was on the train texting all 50 of my nine o'clock students that we were running late because of that delay at Granville, I got one number wrong on one student's phone. Um, and I get this message, who's this? I'm like, oh, it's Dr. Amanda White. I'm trying to contact so-and-so. Oh, no, that's, that's not this person. I'm like, oh, crap. And then I realized I'd had one number wrong. Um, so mistakes can happen. We're human. That's fine. Part of our job is to correct them and uh, to detect them and correct them. But we do need to consider the possibility of fraud. And fraud is really you know, one of these things where we're looking for an intention to deceive, usually. But there are some characteristics of fraud. Usually, there's an incentive or a pressure to commit fraud. That incentive could be a KPI, like you learn about in MDC. All right, key performance indicator for a bonus could create an incentive to engage in fraud. So that's the incentive or the pressure there. There could be an opportunity to commit fraud. And those opportunities come from, usually, lack of internal controls. All right. And then the third thing, there may be attitudes or rationalizations towards fraud. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. OK. So those are my three sort of sections in the fraud triangle. So an example of this could be the self-serve checkout at Woolies or Coles. All right. Now, I've had ethics drummed into me my entire career um, in being an auditor and then in being an academic. We have very high ethical standards in terms of you know, what students should be able to do to pass, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we don't take a bribe from a student for changing their results or anything. But so I never thought that you could cheat the self-checkout system at the supermarket. Never even entered my mind until some students, and they spoke to me anonymously, said, well, we're under intense pressure, right? Quite often we live away from home, we have uni fees to pay for, we have textbooks to pay for, and I work a part-time job. Um, some of those students were caught up in the 7-Eleven type of underpayment of wages. So really, they were working for less than they should have been. So there's extreme pressure on them in terms of how they spend their money. So they thought, well, you know, I really want to eat healthy. I want to be able to afford broccoli. But I'm only on an onion or potato budget, right? Or I want to buy ginger. If you've ever seen the price of ginger, $24 a kilo, it's, it's quite crazy. So the self-checkout gives us an opportunity for fraud, right? If you've been across the road here at uh, Woolworths, there are like 20 registers and one person looking after them. And so that person can't look everywhere at once. So there's an opportunity to buy some very expensive broccoli or something else very expensive and put it down as potatoes and put it in the bag. And then the attitude or their justification for that was, well, you know, Woolworths made however many hundreds of millions of dollars in profit last year. They're not going to notice $10 lost because of me. All right? I, I felt bad one time. I'd been through the self-checkout, and something had gone in my bag that I'd forgotten to scan so much that I went back to the store, and I, like, I, I left my son in the trolley and my husband outside, and I went, I'm just buying this one thing because I felt so bad about it. But fraud can happen anywhere. It could be as simple as the Woolworths Coles self-checkout. It could be as complicated as management feeling pressure to achieve a KPI or to meet an analyst forecast uh, or the board forecast and they're going to be fired. It could be somebody who's been passed over for promotion three or four times. And they grumpily say, well, I'm going to steal these assets, right? I'm going to steal this money because I should have got that promotion and so-and-so got it instead of me. I deserve this. I've worked hard for this company and they owe me. Just like if I said, well, okay, you're going to go to the exam and there's going to be no exam supervisors, right? 
Normally, you sit at your desk and you look down and you don't even try and look somewhere else. I've seen students close their eyes just to stretch so it doesn't look like they're looking at someone else's paper. But if I told you there were no supervisors and there was no cameras and there were no tricks and we were not coming back for two hours, you might be really tempted to just talk to a friend. Yeah? So this can happen to good people, people who start out really ethically. They might make one small fraud to cover up a mistake, which might turn into a bigger fraud and a bigger fraud and a bigger fraud. You could be addicted to the poker machines at the casino or gambling or buying expensive handbags, all right? Or, I don't know, lining up for something else really expensive. But fraud could be anywhere. So we have to watch. So part of my job as the watchdog is to look out for anything of these that could be a fraud and potentially investigate if there is something. So what are my responsibilities for discovering illegal acts? Well, for things that have a direct impact on the financial statements, there's a reasonable expectation that if I see something, I investigate. For indirect things, I don't have any responsibility. But the key is, if I find something or I see something, I should say something. We never, ever, ever stay quiet, all right? So if it's related to the direct effects, then I might report to ASIC, okay? And depending on what sort of industry the firm is in and what it's about, I might report to APRA, which is a potential regulatory authority. If it was something environmental or something to do with imports or exports, I would talk to the relevant government authority. I may also choose to talk to the board of directors. That depends on how high up you think the fraud goes. If you think someone on the board or the CEO is involved in the fraud, then you may wish to go to the audit committee because the audit committee is independent of the board. Now, of course, you'll have to make your own assessment there. If you know that the audit committee is independent directors, but they're all really just friends chosen by the CEO or the board, or the chairman of the board, then you might go around them to someone else. But you know, the board and your audit committee is usually a pretty good bet if you think that the fraud stops at a particular level before then. Right? If you think it's the CEO, don't go tell the CEO because you know, they're going to take your warning about, I know, this is not David Caruso on CSI Miami, where he takes off his sunglasses to the bad guy and he goes, I know you did it. Don't leave town. I'm going to get the evidence to get you. That, that, that's not going to work. Right? That person's going to move their theft off to an offshore bank account and quit their job and empty their house and be gone before you know it. So you, you don't ever be brave like that. Don't you ever confront somebody Always take that to one of your superiors on your audit team, all right? Um, not a good idea to be a junior auditor and directly confront people about fraud. So what are the cycles of the financial statements? We divide the financial statements into cycles. That's because you've got your P&L and you've got your balance sheet. Normally when I write BS, I mean balance sheet. I don't mean the other bullshit BS, all right? So we've got our revenues and we've got our expenses and we have our profit and we have our assets, we have our liabilities and we have our owner's equity. So rather than auditing each of those little accounts, we audit transaction processes and cycles. All right? That makes more sense to think about a business in terms of how they process their transactions. We assign staff members or audit team members to different cycles. All right. Um, and they audit them separately, but then they also talk on a regular basis about what they're finding. All right, so let's look at what these cycles... Um, and the reason that we look at cycles is also because we have double entry bookkeeping. We have debits and we have credits. So if I can prove that this is correct, then I've also sort of indirectly proved that this is correct, okay? So let's look at the sorts of things that could go into sales. Right, we could make sales. I could have accounts receivable. Uh, when people pay their accounts receivable, I'm gonna have cash. 
I could have discounts, I could have refunds. All right. These are all the sorts of things. Oh, and cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold as well. Cogs. All right. So these are all the sorts of things that can go into the sales process. Does that make sense? So I want to audit all of these together in a chain because I know about the double entry bookkeeping. So what else could I look at? Acquisition and payment cycle. So when I buy stuff, right, I generate expenses. If I buy on credit, I have accounts payable. When I make my payments, I have cash. All right. Depending on the expenses, there may need to be prepaid expenses that come out of it, if it's something like rent or something over a longer period of time. OK. What about payroll? For payroll, we could have wages expense. We could have wages payable. Obviously, when we pay people, we pay them with cash. What else comes into the accounting when it comes to wages? Do you just get your wage? What else do you get that accrues over time? Superannuation. What else? Leave liabilities, yes. That could be long service leave, annual leave, sick leave, because they all accrue. You can now cash out annual leave. That's a new thing. All right. So it would make sense, you know, when you're looking at time cards, things, you'd also look at superannuation. Now, if we're looking at inventory, let me pick a different color here. Let's go with brown. If I'm manufacturing stuff, I have raw materials. I have, what else, work in process. I have finished goods inventory. All right, I might have expense write-offs. So obsolete or perhaps damaged stock. I might have accounts payable for when I buy the raw materials and then cash. All right, and also once I've sold my inventory, things move into cost of goods sold. All right, and then the capital acquisition and repayment cycle. So if I'm going to buy some stuff, big assets, I'm going to generate fixed assets. Those fixed assets are going to have depreciation. I'm going to have to have some cash to buy them with, but I'm probably going to get that cash by either raising equity or incurring some long-term liability. Okay, which also means if you've got a long-term liability, you're going to have interest expense. I'm just coming up with these as I think of them here. All right, so it makes sense, and these are not the same for every single company, but this gives you a pretty good idea of the sorts of things that we're going to look at. Now, we're going to focus on these two, sales and acquisition and buying stuff. They're the most common ones. Um, and we're going to use those as examples quite a lot during the semester. So how does, this is back to basic accounting, so you should go, I should know this. Transactions get recorded at the company in journals, they go into ledgers and trial balances and generate the financial statements. As an auditor, I may collect evidence by following a transaction from its origin point all the way to its end point, or I might start with something at the end and go back and follow it right through to its origin story. All right. So there's lots of different ways that we go about collecting evidence. But we tend to follow those two trails. So what do I do in terms of my audit? I perform audit tests of the transactions, my income statement items, and the account balances. Okay, and that means I need to have a different objectives or, as I like to say, measures or characteristics of the truth. What does it mean for a number to be true? Right? Unlike on cop shows, I cannot put the CFO into an interrogation box and say, are you telling the truth on sales? 
Are there any hidden liabilities? Did you fudge the numbers to get this bonus? Um, and I can't hook my CFO up to a lie detector test and ask him about all these things. That's just not how it works. It does on TV when it comes to crimes, but uh, from the financial perspective, no. And the paper doesn't tell me anything either. I look at the income statement, I look at the balance sheet. If I say to the number sales, are you the right number? It's not gonna talk back. Now, if at some point the numbers on the paper do begin to talk back to you, then at this time to put down your audit pen, have a break, have a nap and get some help. All right, the, the documents should never talk back. Okay, so that's just you know, mental health, very important. Will talked about work-life balance earlier and having good uh, work-life balance. Um, auditors are certainly key ones at used to being overworked, especially at this time of year. So if you're in an audit firm and you're coming to class um, and turning up, that is awesome because I know at this time of year how exhausted you can be after working 12 hours and then coming to uni. So we develop these measures or characteristics of truth in a couple of different areas. Oops, I want this one. Uh, blue, okay. In the area of transactions, in the area of balances, and in the area of the presentation and disclosure of the annual report. I'm gonna go through each of those. All right, so I'm, we're gonna learn about a word now that you probably have not heard of before, unless you've already done some accounting uh, and auditing, called the word assertion. So an assertion is a statement one believes is true. And I always think back to Taylor Swift. Poor Taylor Swift, when she gets up on stage at the Video Music Awards to receive her award, and she's standing there and she's about to give her speech to thank her fans for winning Best Music Video of the Year, and Kanye West storms on. He says, Taylor, I'm gonna let you finish, but Beyonce's music video was the best music video of all time, okay? So if you haven't seen it, I'll put a clip up on Facebook so you know what I'm talking about. Does everyone know what I'm talking about? Yes, most people, yes. Some people, maybe not. Um, so some of my international students might be going, who is Kanye West? And really, you're not missing out on much. But Kanye is making an assertion. He is saying, I don't believe that all these people voted for Taylor and she won. Here is what I believe is true, okay? So when management present to us the profit and loss and the balance sheet, they are saying, this is what we think is true. Now go and check it, okay? And we have to decide whether our version of the truth matches their version of the truth or the differences. That makes sense? Okay, so every single number that management put on here is their assertion about what they believe is true. This is like every grandma in existence. My grandson is the cutest, is the smartest, is the whatever. This is your parents at graduation, all right? They'll come to me, oh, wasn't my son or daughter the best student? I usually just nod and smile, so you don't have to worry there about me letting any secrets out, all right? But we need to figure out whether that is true. So we are going to use something called the financial statement assertions out of ASA 315 to determine whether they are true, all right? And they're gonna give us some specific rules on what evidence to collect. Because if you said, okay, collect evidence to prove sales are true, you wouldn't know where to start. How do I figure that out? Do I interrogate all the customers? What do I need to do? So I'm gonna go through these assertion. All right, here we go. Number one, occurrence. An occurrence is really about asking, did these things really happen? Did they occur? Are, are these sales real? Are these expenses real? Number two, completeness. Have we recorded all of the transactions? All right. Or are we missing some? 
could be that a company who is perhaps not making as much profit as they would like might forget to include some expenses within the financial statements. Accuracy. Accuracy is all about recording at the correct dollars. Sell something for 50, have I recorded it at 50? Classification is about the recording of transactions at the correct amounts. All right, so am I doing my debit and credit to the right places? Okay, and then cutoff. All right, and cutoff is about recorded in the correct financial period. So here is my end of financial year. If I sold something at this point in time, should it be recorded this year or the next year? That, that'll depend on delivery and change of ownership. So for P&L accounts, which is my transactions, I'm going to prove that a sale is true and fair if I can prove that they all did occur. I've recorded everything at the correct dollar amount in the correct journals in the correct period. And if all of those five are satisfied, then that account we will class as being true. How are we going? Does that make sense to everybody? Yes? Awesome. I can see some nods. I'm, I'm assuming everybody else is internally nodding if you're not visually nodding to me. Okay, now we're looking at balances. So these are our assets, our liabilities, and our owner's equity. We know that's not the accounting thing. I'm just lumping them together. All right, number one. Let me change pen colors here. Existence. Did they actually exist? Are they real? Is a chair on an asset register really something physically somewhere? Or it could be intangible. You know, we have uh, certainly goodwill and things. Number, one, number two is completeness. Again, it's that focus on all accounts. Have we recorded all of our assets, which is usually likely? Have we recorded all of our liabilities? If I'm a bit close to my leverage ratios, a bit too much debt, I might try and forget. That was Centro Shopping Centres. They tried to forget some debt, like it didn't exist. Number three, valuation and allocation. Now I'm going to break these into two parts. The valuation is about, again, dollars, but the reason that we use valuation is because it's usually a more complex calculation. All right, I make a sale, it's really easy. I sell a good for 50, $50 comes back. That's easy to record. But if I buy a piece of property, plant and equipment, it's not just the purchase price that goes into PP&E. What goes into PP&E costs? What sort of things? Purchase price, what else? Installing, yep. Anything else? What was that one? Commissions, yes, yeah, sorry. I'm losing my hearing. It's part of getting old, all right? There could be delivery fees. There could be testing fees, all right? You might need to even build a new building for a machine. Okay, and then once you've figured out that purchase price, every year you're going to need to calculate depreciation for it. So the reason we use the word valuation is because it's a much more complicated process than just a sale or an expense. So we use the word value to take into account that complexity. All right, the next one, I'm going to do this in a different color so that we can just have some differentiation here, is allocation. All right, and allocation is really more about, am I looking at the correct spot on the balance sheet? So is this an asset or liability or owner's equity? That's usually easy to figure out. But the more difficult one is, is it current or non-current? Okay. Most food manufacturers will have current inventory. I'm pretty sure I wouldn't want to buy anything from Woolworths that might be non-current inventory. But people tell me that things like spam can last for years. So if you wanted to, you could probably buy a whole lot of spam and keep it as non-current inventory. But what sort of industries do you think might have non-current inventory? What sort of companies? 
Furniture, yeah, you might have something. Anything else? Wine. Wine and alcohol is probably one of the biggest areas where we see a lot of non-current assets in terms of food and beverage production. Think about 30-year-old whiskies, your Penfolds Grange, where you have wine sitting in there for long periods of time. Sometimes we can have non-current assets. If you said to me, we have a whole lot of chickens at Woolworths as non-current assets, I'd be like, how old are those chickens? Don't really want to eat those. Okay, now we're going on to rights. And rights are about assets. Do I own or control the asset? And then we have obligations. And obligations apply to the liabilities. All right. So the stuff you learned um, in ABC about ownership and control, again, comes back in here with these. So for our assets, liabilities, and owner's equity, if I can prove that all my assets exist, I've recorded all of them at the correct value, in the correct spot on the balance sheet, and I have a right to recognise those assets, then I will say that asset is true and fair in its presentation. That sound okay to everybody? Awesome, fantastic. Now we have presentation and disclosure, and P and D is really about what goes into the annual report. And what we're going to focus on is we're going to focus on the transaction and the balance assertions. I'm going to go through the P&D ones today, but we're not going to look at them in great detail. And you'll notice that there's a lot of um, recurring themes, occurrence, rights, obligations, completeness, accuracy. The only one that is new is this one, understandability. That is, to a sophisticated, reasonably well-educated user of the financial statements like us, is the information disclosed in an understandable manner? Now, that's not usually just the income statement and the balance sheet, but that also applies to all of the note disclosures. And there's usually 30 or 40 pages of those. Have they been laid out and written out in a way that is understandable by a reasonably educated user? Now, as a junior auditor, you're going to do lots of gathering of evidence on transactions and on balances and those assertions. The reason that we're not going to spend a lot of time on the P&D stuff is that this type of work is usually done at the senior or manager level of the audit. Um, so going into great depth of that now isn't going to prepare you for that vacation job or that graduate job. That's my um, goal for the subject, is to make sure that you can go to the first day of your internship or of your grad job and when they say, OK, do this test, you're going to know exactly what to do. So how do these fit together? Occurrence and existence are pretty similar, but I use different words because I can't say, did this chair occur? It just doesn't make sense. All right, so I use different, slightly different terms. Completeness means the same thing. Accuracy and valuation. The valuation is slightly more complicated. Allocation sort of goes down here with classification. And then cutoff and rights ob obligations are, are more about rights. Do I have a right to record it this year? Do I own the asset? Do I have a liability obligation? Now, I also go through the assertions again in a, another video on YouTube. Obviously, this is being recorded for the lecture as well. Um, but there's also another video there if you want to watch that one on assertions. All right. Explain the relationship between the assertions and collecting or accumulating evidence. And remember, I need that evidence to come up with my opinion. And just like I wouldn't charge someone with murder or a crime unless I had enough evidence, I need to have evidence to come up with my opinion. So I have to, and here's my job. My job is to plan audit procedures, specific methods to collect evidence about each of the assertions. And I can't get away with just testing one assertion out of five or two of them. I must collect evidence on all of the assertions to prove that my account is correct. My plan of audit procedures is called an audit program. It's pretty much my recipe for doing the audit, okay? Now, this is where it's going to get a little bit difficult uh, and where students sometimes struggle a little bit, all right? 
So does anybody here do something artistic? Anybody draw? I draw very badly. Anybody paint? Play a musical instrument? One person, I play the piano also very badly. Like most Asian children, I was given the option of violin or piano. Um, I took the piano. And I, I wasn't very good. I was never one of these child Asian prodigies whose parents would trot them out and say, look how good my child plays. My parents would be like, she's doing okay. I was just not very, that was not my thing. Anybody here like to cook? A few people. Who's good at cooking without a recipe? That's not me. Some people, all right. So all of these different things, or dance, anybody dance? Oh, I will send a, I will share a photo with you guys on Facebook. Um, so I can dance. I won't tell you in which style, but I will send you all a photo on Facebook this evening, so you can keep an eye out for that. You'll be really shocked. It's nothing, it's nothing risque or anything. It wasn't a pole dancer. But um, certainly, you know, we all have a bit of a creative side. If you're not very creative and you've never thought of yourself as being creative, this is going to be your chance. And I'm going to give you an analogy here, and you're going to go like, what is Amanda on about? She has lost her mind. Audit programs or audit plans are like fried rice. And I use the fried rice example because I'm Chinese. Okay. And I, I really do like fried rice. My, my son is addicted to hockey and fried rice, loves the fried rice. So I come from a fairly big Asian family. Um, and my, my grandmother was actually born here um, in Sydney um, in the early 1930s, I think it was. Um, and, and then she was raised back in China. But my parents came out here before communism. Um, so my grandma had six children. So I have six, and they all got married. I have six aunties. And at every Chinese event, all of my aunties bring fried rice, all right? And something else, but they all bring fried rice. And they all bring fried rice because they think their fried rice is the right way to do fried rice. <laughs> yeah? And um, so, you know, we have a lot of fried rice and they're very competitive. Oh, which fried rice do the children like most? Which fried rice gets eaten? Which one has leftovers? And so there's always lots of arguments about fried rice. Do you use cold rice? like old rice from the day before, yes. Or do you use fresh rice? My auntie who is, on, is very, very healthy uses brown rice. That's not terribly tasty. Um, one of my aunties married into the family, she's Thai. So she is a big proponent of pineapple and chicken in fried rice. I'd never had chicken in fried rice before I had her fried rice. And I'm like, there's pineapple and chicken in this. That's weird, but really tasty. There's arguments about what sort of oil you should use, whether you should use light soy sauce or dark soy sauce. And uh, my dad's actually the one that makes the fried rice in my family because my mum's a very average cook. And um, he always uses dark soy sauce. So fried rice with light soy just always tastes weird to me because that's what I've grown up with. There's arguments about whether there should be corn, about whether there should be prawns whether you should buy the fatty char siu or the lean char siu. Yeah, of course that's the fatty one. That's where all the flavor is, all right? How much salt you should put in, how you do the egg. There's two options for the egg. Number one, you cook the egg in the wok first and you make it really thin and then you chop it up into fine ribbons and then toss it through later. Or you crack the egg in while you're stirring everything else raw and then you mix it up. Sort of like Nazi Goring a bit style. Yeah? Yeah, people, a lot of the students are like, yeah, I, you know, I understand what you're talking about. So while there are, and the whole point of this is that number one, I want you to think of me when you're eating fried rice. Number two is that even though there are lots of different forms of fried rice from lots of different parts of China and from Hong Kong and, you know, there's the Indonesian version and the Malaysian version and the Singaporean version, uh, you know, the East Timorese version of fried rice. There's the westernized Australian version of fried rice. They all taste pretty good in the end, except the brown rice one, right? The brown rice is never tasty. It's 
just, I'm sorry, I know it's good for me. And look, I eat a lot of rice, so I'm bound to get diabetes. It's an Asian thing, right? Everybody's parents at some point will have to have diet managed diabetes. And your parents will have to cut out the rice and it'll be just the worst thing ever. Try and tell an old Asian parent that they can't have rice. It's bad news. So it's all tasty. It all is nutritious. All right, some might give us more heart disease than others, but it all gets there in the end. All right, and this is going to be what it's like when we're designing methods to collect our evidence. You might have a different method in your design exercise than everybody else, and that doesn't matter, as long as it meets the assertion. And I'm gonna teach you how to do it. There's four rules to follow that are really simple, and if you follow those four rules, you can't go wrong, all right? So don't be concerned if your answers are not like everybody else's. Right? This is why I tell my son, don't worry if you don't look like everyone else. Right? I went to school in a very white part of Sydney. People used to ask, Do you, does your mum make spring rolls for dinner? Do you get to eat fried rice and sweet and sour pork as much as you like? I'd never eaten beef and black bean sauce until I went to dinner for the very first time at my now in-laws place. And they thought that they would order takeaway to make me feel more at home. And we had sweet and sour pork, Mongolian lamb, and beef and black bean sauce. Of which the Mongolian lamb and the beef and black bean sauce, I had never tried in my entire life and I was 19 at this point. So it's okay to be different. This is where I want you to be creative. Think about what you could do with the stuff that you've got. Right? This is mystery box time on MasterChef. All right, so don't be afraid to try new things. That's really critical. All right, that's it for tonight, everybody. Thank you for listening to my stories. If you have fried rice between now and next week, think about me. Think about your assertions. Assertions are going to be key for next week's quiz.